Okay, so um, today I'm going to be speaking a little bit about this, um, but I, I thought I would adapt the content a little bit, um, considering that this is uh, FOSS Asia and um, not FOSS Node. Um, so uh, this is a talk that I've given before a couple of times. Um, I gave it in Korea, I gave it in uh, Australia, and I also gave it here. Here's a picture of me do giving the same talk uh, in Singapore. Uh, these are some other things that I've done. I uh, do Singapore JS, Camp JS, which is a conference in Australia. Um, I work for Node Source, and sometimes I host uh, the Node Up podcast. Um, those are my that's my Twitter handle. Don't try to pronounce that, and that's my GitHub. So the primary thing that we're going to be talking about today is over engineering and how we can take some steps, um, get some ideas on trying to curb the urge um, to do this. So what is over-engineering? Uh, it's the adding of unnecessary complexity. And as engineers, uh, anybody who's involved in any kind of uh, complicated projects, uh, you're going to be 100% uh, aware. You will have experienced this at some point um, in your life. You may be experiencing it right now. <coughs> so complexity uh, is, in my experience, the absolute number one killer of all projects that I've ever worked on. Any, any, if there's a problem with it, it's usually related to just uh, complexity getting completely out of control. Um, when you've got a complex system, it's difficult to understand it, it's, which makes it more difficult to um, you know, fix bugs, makes it uh, increasingly difficult to add new features. Uh, over time, projects end up becoming uh, slower and slower to, you know, if you want to add a new feature, it ends up taking three weeks instead of what you would expect to take you know, a day or a few hours. Uh, and this is just uh, overall a, a bad problem. Complexity is something that you want to do. It's, the prim it's, it's your pr uh, enemy number one as an engineer. But unfortunately, you as an engineer, you are the thing that's creating it. <coughs> uh, we have a very strong urge to over-engineer and hence create complexity in our projects. So the, this urge to over-engineer, uh, it probably comes from experiences that we've had in the past. So almost all of us have been bitten by projects which have been under-engineered and perhaps, and also all of the documentation that we read, you know, books and blog posts, they're all, most of them are about trying to solve the problems of people who have under-engineered. But in my experience, there's been a lot more people uh, who are suffering from uh, the curse of over-engineering than under-engineering. Uh, and in fact, I, I think that a lot of these books and blogs are harmful to developers uh, minds uh, because they encourage them to generate solutions which may have been designed for um, in a completely different set of constraints. So what I'm trying to say is that your the things which work for a multi-million dollar startup which has to which cannot have failure at all it must succeed uh, is that's a very different and it may have hundreds of employees uh, is a very different set of constraints to what you have if you're working in a startup. Uh, or most typical um, projects have uh, a very different set of constraints to what I, I believe a lot of these books uh, are written for. And uh, in trying to follow the, the books, I've ended up and I've ended up creating a lot of problems for myself. So this is I've been on both ends of the spectrum here, and I'm trying to sort of find a nice middle ground. So one of the problems that we experience is that. Um, we often build things that we want to build rather than building things that we need to build. So uh, there's a good comic which uh, covers this. So this is, this is something that I think every engineer can relate to. Um, and it might be uh, some, a feature that you want to build because you know, it seems cool, or it might be using a new technology um, because you think that it sounds cool. It's something that you want to do um, to help you learn, but it might not be the appropriate tool for the job, or it might not be the most efficient way of actually solving the current set of problems that you have right now. And so, yeah, we often, we often build things that we want, not, not that we, uh, things that we need. And actually, a good, a good way to figure out whether you're potentially doing something not for the right reasons is to detect whether you actually want to do it. Often the things which we need to do are the things that we don't want to do. Uh, it's an unfortunate thing. So if you think that you're going to enjoy 
building something, um, you're probably going to build it wrong. It's a horrible reality, I'm sorry. Um, so another problem that we have is that we'll often spend hours in order to save ourselves minutes. Uh, and also, saving us, uh, um, we'll spend hours solving problems that just will never happen in our production systems. Uh, this is something you're encouraged to do. You're encur if you're going to write a, um, a, a routine, uh, a function, you want it to be able to take into account you know, all the edge cases, the extremes, um, and you want it to be able to handle weird input. But you know, reality is, in a lot of applications, that function will never need to do that. Um, the things that you build don't always need to be completely robust. Uh, there's a good example here, another comic. <laughs> so again, uh, engineers should find this very familiar. Um, it'll save time in the wrong run, long run. Um, so yeah, not everything needs a military-grade solution. We don't need to be always designing everything to be at 100% quality 100% of the time. This is, this is a major problem that uh, I experience. It's very hard to resist the urge to make something clean and better and uh, solve a problem perfectly um, when, when you know there's a way to make it better. Uh, yeah, it's difficult to, to resist that urge. I find that I'm often building the wrong thing for the right reasons. I can justify why I need to do this. I can ha I've got all the excuses in the world but reality is it's uh, often not the right thing I should be building. I don't need to build yet another package to publish on NPM. I don't need to um, you know, create all this infrastructure when you, a lot of the time you can solve uh, simple things you know, using just a couple of lines of code. So it's important to uh, always be asking you, yourself these two questions. Uh, this will keep you on the right track. So always keep in mind what problem that you're trying to solve and is, the, is my solution to this problem the simplest thing uh, to solve that problem? And often we'll find ourselves solving problems in these big complex ways when um, in order just to, for example, just to pass the test or to get something displayed to the user, you could have just done something simple. Um, and I think sometimes we fear things which don't, which will never eventuate. So we think that we need to design all this stuff because, you know, scalability or whatever. Um, but maybe once you've actually implemented it and it's working, you'll, you'll feel better about, you know, your crappy solution and because you'll realize that you've actually got bigger problems to, be, um, to, to solve. Another thing I've discovered is that when I go to do a proper solution, this can take hours. It ends up involving uh, an awful lot of yak shaving. I end up diving deep into... Um, you know, solving problems which will expose more problems, which will expose more problems because I'm trying to do everything properly. Um, but in the end, uh, I could have solved it simply. And I yeah, have discovered that five to ten times is about the uh, order, uh, it's the amount of complexity and time that I'm adding on top of the simple solution. So over engineering is, I find, much more costly and more common than uh, under engineering. And one of the reasons why this is is because um, when we over-engineer, we often end up with uh, we end up building the wrong structure, and the wrong structure can be more costly than having no structure at all. The most flexible piece of code is code that which hasn't made any assumptions, and you can come in and just grab some pieces and move things around. I found that sometimes when I'm working on a piece of rubbish code, I'm actually a lot more effective than something which has been you know, very well designed because it's much easier to understand a straightforward, simple, you know, uh, you know not in, a very under-engineered piece of code than it is to understand something which has got a thousand design patterns and things going everywhere and code going all over the place. Um, so I have a comic for this. Um, now this is an attack on, on object orientation. Uh, this is just what happens in pretty much every software project. Starts out like that, ends up like that. Um, you know, these tr this tree structure is pretty much, this is the ideal structure. In fact, well, a line, a linear line of um, dependencies and organization it would be ideal. But obviously, things require a little bit more complexity than that. So um, if you can get things into a tree structure, that's the, that's the ideal situation. Um, but flat's better than that. 
Um, but as soon as you descend into a graph, that's when the nightmares start happening. So uh, in order to be able to you know, keep things as close to a tree as possible, we want to um, defer decisions about uh, any kind of architectural things, just because they're going to be more difficult to um, reverse. Uh, so yeah, defer those decisions, because at, in, in the future, you're going to have more information about whatever that problem is. And once you've got more information, you can make a better decision. Uh, but if you make a decision up front, um, in order to make a different decision, you need to first yeah, back out of that decision, go to the new one. Uh, and if you are going to make a decision, make sure you've always got a recovery plan. You're always thinking about, how am I going to undo this? Because yeah, always assume that what you're doing is wrong. Um, and make sure that you can always back out of things. So this is one of the reasons why I try to stay away from uh, framework because framework code, because frameworks often, you, well, you can't back out of using that framework without making uh, incredible changes to your code base. So try to do that. Um, and another way to say that is optimize for deletion. So when you're building things, wherever possible, make it so that if you need to suddenly remove this stuff, it's going to be easy. So what that means is that if, you're, if you've got a thing and then it's reaching into all, this is about managing dependencies, I guess. Uh, if you've got a thing which is reaching into all different parts of your application, it's going to be very difficult to remove or change uh, the application. So ideally, you sort of try to keep everything together and um, make it easy to remove. So let's talk a little bit about Node. So Node has a culture of extreme modularity. And what that means is it, it, it differs a little bit from a lot of other uh, software environments um, because everything's a module. There's a, there's a module for that is a, a common phrase which is uttered in the uh, you know, node world. Uh, so you know, there's, there's modules for everything. There's modules for like reversing a list. There's modules for, uh, I don't know. I think there's, even, there's a module for no-op, like literally a no-op. But that has actually been recently superseded by no-op 2. Um, so anyway, uh, Node, Node has been, uh, you, when you build a Node application, you build it up out of you know, a hierarchy of you know, lots of little pieces. And it, you might see, OK, well, if all this stuff's on NPM, uh, this might be how to build an application. I should build my application up out of all these little pieces. But I've, dis I've discovered that trying to do that up front is very expensive, because you'll often modularize something uh, in the wrong way, and you might need to reverse that, or perhaps you've modularized it in one way, but it, mm, like you need this thing over here needs access to this, so then this needs a, a, uh, a reference to this thing, and then so now suddenly you've got a graph, and that's when things start to go to hell. So point is, you should try to avoid premature abstraction until you really need to break something out into another file or to another package or to another module. Don't do it. And s mm. Certainly, don't start by building different applications. This is a, another common piece of advice. You know, the way to avoid building big applications is to not build big applications. But uh, reality is that if you've got multiple applications, you're incurring a huge amount of overhead in making sure that those applications work well together, um, much more than just making simple func function calls. So the point is, abstractions, um, they're often claimed as, you know, just if you're going to when you're building something, you should just always be abstracting it and, uh, and making it more and more abstract. Uh, but abstraction is not always a good thing because it does this to it. it. You decrease the local complexity, but you increase the global complexity. So you, know, you may have experienced this in uh, you know, having very difficult to set up environments and things like that. That's because all there's, you know, you've got like Docker containers and all these bits connecting to each other. That's bad. Um, so just be aware that any time you make, uh, you add modularity or create an abstraction, you're, um, you're just moving uh, the complexity around. Sometimes it's worth it, sometimes it's not. It's just not always good. So the point is, uh, publishing to N uh, in the context of Node, publishing to NPM is not the only way to do modular code. You've got all these other options. Uh, so you can, even within, sometimes these days, rather than trying to find a good way to break something up into multiple functions, I'll just keep them all in one function and just break it up by having fancy comments in between the different sections. Sometimes later I'll, be, I'll break that stuff out into uh, multiple functions, but the, uh, the point is, is that when you, the, one of the key benefits of doing modularity is that you get 
a, you get this organizational benefit, it gets cleaner. Um, but it's actually possible to get that organizational benefit of modularization without any of the overhead. Uh, and again, I mentioned <sighs> microservices. Like those things give you so little, um, you know, the same benefit that you would have got from just breaking that thing out as a comment. Um, but you know, all this additional overhead. Anyway, flat's better than nested. That's a common thing. People know this. Um, so you should try to avoid creating wild goose chases for your colleagues. I mentioned that a little bit before. You know, don't. It, you know, we've all tried to debug problems where the thing goes into this thing and then goes into this thing, comes back around here. That's no good. And often these things are created by people designing overly complicated solutions. The simplest thing is probably flat. Let's get back to the main point, though. Modular versus modul uh, monolith. Monolith. Um, the point is, uh, the sweet spot's probably somewhere in between. Maybe it's called a modulith. That's a pretty stupid name. I don't know. But anyway, usually the best plan is to go monolith first. It's kind of like the idea of you prototype your ideas first, and then you can progressively modularize out as you need to, but only when you need to. Uh, and doing this progressive modularization, should, uh, you should end up uh, doing less over-engineering and it should help you build the simplest thing that will work. Um, avoid unnecessary complexity, build the simplest thing that will work. Thank you. Any questions? Do we have questions? Yeah, yeah I thought I didn't stop any questions for Tim. Anybody completely disagree? <laughs> That's okay. Oh, was that a question or were you disagreeing? Oh, okay. Um, if you pursue this approach, uh, how do you make sure that uh, it isn't misused or abused uh, as a, um, well, a way to, uh, as an excuse for just laziness? So the question is, uh, if you use this approach, how do you stop it from being abused as an, as an excuse for laziness? Uh, and I guess the thing is, is that you don't break things out until you need to, and it's deciding when you need to. Um, when things start to, when, uh, I've, I've discovered that in my apps, when things start breaking and I'm like, whoa, what the hell's going on there? When things start happening and I don't expect it to happen, that's usually a sign that the thing's gotten too big and I need to start splitting some stuff out. Uh, and usually by that point, the thing's mature enough that you'll, there'll be some obvious slice points that you can make that you know, all right, if I slice it here, this isn't gonna have a huge impact on, um, on the app. Uh, so I guess it's just uh, diligence. It, it, it is hard, but I feel like having an under-engineered app, uh, as long as, it, oh, in both cases, if they grow out of control, it, you can write bad code by over-engineering and under-engineering. It's, it's striking a balance. So the answer is I don't know. <laughs> can I just add on? Sure. So uh, like about uh, February 29, DHH, the founder of Rails, wrote mm -hmm. this article called The Majestic Monolith. Mm -hmm. And he says why, because Basecamp code was kept in one project, the team, small team as his, had so much more benefit. And uh, when I read this, I actually thought of Tim's one. Mm. And I think last month, the Ghost, which is a Node.js uh, application, open source application for blogging, the founder came over to Singapore, and we asked him the same question, because Node is a very modular thing. And he was like, he was criticized by the core Node team for making a monolith project. So both mm -hmm. DHH uh, for Basecamp and uh, John for Ghost, the two big projects that you can take examples for Tim's talk. You, you'll find that uh, the people who are good examples of open source contributors aren't necessarily going to be good people to develop apps for you um, because they're going to, and this was me before, uh, you know, I, I was trying to build, my, my allegiance was with open source and so I would sacrifice the app in order to build more open source modules. Uh, and th this isn't efficient. It, does, it doesn't build apps better or faster. It just sort of builds them different Great for open source, not so great for the app. Uh, it's un unfortunate. Anything else? All right. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Oh, one more thing. Oh, oh, oh. Camp JS. <laughs>
just a little plug. Um, I don't run this conference anymore, but uh, it's a one that I started uh, happening in Australia. It's in Sydney. Um, the dates are here. 3rd to 6th of June 2016, go to this website. This is a good example of over-engineering, it's all 3D. Um, so, I didn't build it. Um, but anyway, uh, please come to my conference. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun, goes for the whole weekend, L lots of good stuff. Uh, I think, has anybody here been to Camp JS? No, there are people in Singapore who have been to Camp JS, just they're not here. And I've heard that it's good, so thanks. Thanks very much.